Welcome, gentlemen. I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is Steve Kyle. I have the privilege of being an elder here at the bridge. We're going to be looking at Mike in chapter 3 tonight, and we'll first um, open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word tonight. We appreciate that you preserved it to us. We appreciate that we can um, understand more of your mind and how you want us to think and how our minds should imitate yours. I thank you for these men, for their willingness to be here tonight, for volunteering their time when they could have spent it many other ways. Um, I personally thank you for the privilege of sharing your work. Such a privilege always. So many men and women, but probably men over the years, more, gave their lives just so that we could read an English Bible today. And we so appreciate it. Um, all that went before us to allow us to be in this place. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to look at Micah chapter 3 tonight. Um, before we actually read Micah chapter 3, we're going to get a bird's eye view of Old Testament history. And this is truly a bird's eye view, okay? But I want you to understand a little bit more where Micah falls into the total flow of things. I don't want, to, I don't want this to be a history lesson, but I think you should understand. So, way over is creation, right? Genesis 1. And then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right there. Um, you'll notice the year at the bottom of that is about 2000 BC. Then you have the slavery in Egypt, which is about 400 plus years now. Okay? Then you get to the point of Moses leading the people out of the land of Egypt. Then, remember, there was the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Then Joshua leads them into the promised land. Right? That's, and you'll notice the year there, it is more accurately 1400 or maybe 1450 BC. There's some um, differences about that dating, but it's probably more reliably 1450 or so. So we're talking about 600 years between Abraham's time and when the children of Israel are actually going into the promised land. Okay? Just to give you a ballpark. Then comes the Judges period. As you can see from the date for the Moses and Joshua time frame, the Judges period until we get to the kings. If you remember the children of Israel, okay, Children of Israel told God they wanted a king. Right? They said, we want a king like everybody else. And God told them, this is what's going to happen. He told Samuel to tell them, this is what a king is going to do. But, that's what you want. And God told Samuel this as well. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Here's their king. Saul was the first king. Right? So we go from Saul. We're not going to read about Saul, but Saul made some major, major poor choices um, that had national, personal and national consequences. But Saul, David, and Solomon in the 1000 B.C. reign, so there's about 400 years between Moses and Joshua and coming into the Promised Land to the time of the kings. Then, finally, after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam becomes king. There's kind of rebe rebellion over that. So he stays, Rehoboam, his, Solomon's son, stays the king of what are the um, southern two tribes that are referred to as the... the the nation of Judah, or the kingdom of Judah, right? The northern ten tribes, remember there are twelve total tribes of Israel, right? The northern ten tribes, and you'll see there in the next portion of that diagram, there's an Israel that's north, that's the northern ten tribes, there's Judah that's south, okay? But there are two separate kingdoms. We'll read a little more about the king of the northern ten tribes, his name was Jeroboam. He made some incredibly poor choices that had huge national consequences. And we'll read kind of briefly about that later. It's after that that we begin to see some of what are referred to as the minor prophets. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. But there's this, what is referred to as the divided kingdom or the divided monarchy. It's after that that you have the carrying away. Israel's carried away as a nation in 722. You see it there in the diagram. <clears throat> Judah in 586. It's after that that the shorter prophets or the minor prophets come. The Micah that we're reading about is in that time frame. Okay? Just so you understand biblical history. Part of the reason I wanted you to have an overview of this is not just because it's a history lesson, but because it's redemptive history. It is how God wanted, He wanted Israel to be 
a nation of priests. He wanted Israel to be a theocracy. He wanted to be their leader, God to be their leader, right? That's why it was so, I will say, heartbreaking to God when Israel comes up and says, we want a king. Because God was supposed to be the king. But that's why he told Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. He wanted them to be a theocracy. He wanted them to be a nation of priests. They were to be the intermediary between God and man, right? Everybody was going to be blessed through Abraham and Abraham's seed, the 12 tribes of Israel. But that's, the, the children of Israel never got there. They continued to make poor choices, which we'll talk about. In any case, this represents redemptive history. How God tried and tried and tried and tried. And in Micah, is still trying to bring them back to him. The chapter we'll read tonight is, it's essentially, the whole chapter is reproof. We'll read it, of course. But the whole chapter is reproof because of poor decisions leaders in Israel were making. And what happened to the nation because of that. In any case, um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is, well, let's talk, and I hope you can see this. I apologize, this is a little small, but I wanted you to see this. But before we, I mention a couple things about this, I wanted to mention, you may have heard of Micah and Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all of those guys, as minor prophets, okay? Um, if you have a paper Bible or digital Bible or whatever you got, 2 Timothy 3.16, please. And some of you, if you went through SOD, you may have memorized this, these couple of verses. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. Okay. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We'll look at this in a little more detail a little later. I simply wanted to point out that any, any man of God that is involved in this process of recording God's word on paper, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is not minor. <laughs> minor prophet is an oxymoron. There's no way somebody can be a prophet and be minor. Shorter, yes. Minor, no. <laughs> so we have to have a high, a, a consistently high um, opinion of God's word. That, and that uh, let's look at a couple of these things here. Uh, yeah. That word, um, given by inspiration of God, that phrase, given by inspiration of God, is a translation of the Greek word theonoustos. Okay? Theonoustos is the way I learned to actually pronounce it in college. <laughs> so what it essentially means is God breathed. Now, the point being, that indicates, by the way that it refers to God's word, that God's word is the very life of God. Just like in Genesis 2, it says he breathed in his... God breathed it into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The God-breathed word is the very life of God. We have to consistently come to God's word when we study, when we read devotionally, when we are sharing with other people. We have to come to God's word with that attitude, that it is the very life of God. And we always have to understand it in that context. We always try to bring ourselves up to the level of God's word, not bring God's word down to our level, if you know what I mean. So we have to understand that that is God-breathed. Uh, we're going to go back here for a moment, right here. Again, this is just in the context of where Micah falls in, I will refer to it as redemptive history, which is really what Old Testament history is, leading up to the time of, of Jesus Christ. Okay. So again, you can see these, the prophets, um, and I'll mention something, Daniel is in here as a prophet, you can see the middle column there says the prophets and it lists them. And it's listing them in chronological order. So you'll notice Micah is about in the middle. And um, on either side of this are those divided kingdom kings that I mentioned to you. And there are good ones and bad ones. This diagram shows that. It's hard for me to see. If you want, if you want to actually see this yourself, um, this is out of Rose's, I don't see Rose's publications. Um, it's in their Old Testament chronology uh, page. 
It's outstanding. It has a ton of information there. And some of these kings are terrible. Some of these kings are good. And all of these prophets are constantly calling people back to God. Calling people back and back and back. You even see this referred to in the New Testament in Stephen's speech. When he finally gets to the end of it, he talks about the fact that God rose up early and sent the prophets to try to convince the Israelites to come back. But it never worked. They would kill him, they would persecute him, but they never listened. So, let's, before we go further, let's read Micah chapter 3. Okay? And I'm going to read in the New King James Version. Okay? So, Micah chapter 3. And I said, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, are you rulers of the house of Israel? Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, because they have been evil in their deeds. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets, who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore you shall have night without vision, and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But truly, I, uh, Micah is referring to himself now when he says this, but truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob, and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice, and pervert all equity, who build up Zion, that refers to Jerusalem, with bloodshed, and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay. And her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. As I mentioned, the entire chapter is all reproof of any. The only thing I wanted to just point out that it's reproof to leaders. It's to the heads of the people. It's to the priests. It's to the prophets. One of the major things, we're not going to look real closely at this, but one of the major things is they ran it for the money because you see that over and over again. So this is essentially reproof to leaders. And we'll talk about the fact that generally speaking, generally statement, people are going to go the way the leaders go. However the leaders go is generally speaking the way people are going to go too. And that's what we see here. So let's talk a little bit about 2 Timothy 3.16. Um, I'm going to mention this to you, but this is only in passing. Um, the order of the books in the Old Testament is different in the Hebrew Bible. The minor prophets, like we call them the minor prophets, or what I will say are the shorter prophets, are in a Hebrew Bible, all 12 of them in one book. So they're not Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, all separate like they are in our Bible. They're not in that same order either. And this is the order of the books in the Hebrew Bible. And interestingly, um, take your Bibles and look at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. <coughs> By the time of the New Testament, um, the Hebrew... If I use the word canon of Scripture, does everybody know what that means? Yes? The canon of Scripture, the acceptable books that we feel are inspired, and that's essentially the canon of Scripture. Um, by the time of Jesus Christ, the Hebrew canon of Scripture was essentially intact. It was as we know it now. The Hebrew canon of Scripture was as we know it now. So if you look at Luke chapter 24, verse 44, this is Jesus Christ um, speaking, and he says... 
And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So essentially that's the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible, the law of the prophets, and the, called the law of the prophets and the writings. And those are the books that are in those sections of the Hebrew Bible in that order today as well, just like they were at the time of Christ. Because this canon of scripture, strong evidence indicates, it was intact just like we know it now. The only reason I want to point this out to you is that the prophets, you'll see under the prophets there, the, the 12 prophets, that was all one book. Okay? Um, in the Hebrew, in the, in the synagogues, they would have, I don't know if you grew up in a, an organized church, I grew up in the Lutheran, we would have, every Sunday, we would have gospel readings and epistle readings, and there was a schedule they would follow. The Hebrew people did the same thing. The Jewish people did the same thing. They called a reading, uh, they called a group of readings, you know, the list of readings they had, they called them sederim. So one individual reading was a seder, right? So they, would, they had a group of these readings for these 12 prophets, but it was never just, they would span books. They would go like, Hosea such and such to the next book. It wasn't, you could see from the way that they organized the reading, they didn't consider this book discrete, and then this book, and then this book. They considered them all one book because of the way they read them right on through. Um, the only other thing I want to point out here is that Daniel is in the writings. He's not considered a prophet. In the Hebrew canon, he's not a prophet. We consider that a prophetic book, and I'm not saying there's not prophecy in it as we understand the word prophecy. But, Remember, the word prophecy, which not going to, we're going to develop this, I, I think I talked about this, I'm not sure when, I don't remember. Prophecy does not mean foretelling only. It means forthtelling, that is speaking forth God's word and foretelling. The first man referred to as a prophet in the Bible is Abraham. He didn't foretell anything. <laughs> but he did foretell. And most of what we read in the Bible that is, we consider prophetic, it's that prophetic books, it's foretelling. I'm not saying there's not foretelling, but that's not the bulk of it. So prophecy is both fore and foretelling. But Daniel, in the Hebrew canon, is not considered a prophet. Just point that out. Um, so let's look at, um, we talked about the fact that this was all, um, the whole chapter that we read in Micah 3, is all reproof. He's all saying, you know, you're doing this, and you're not supposed to do that, and you're not supposed to do that, and you're not supposed to do that, all to leaders. Uh, of the people, priests, prophets. The people that are supposed to be the most responsible. It would be like all the heads of the church um, doing whatever they do for money only. Right? That's what the whole chapter is about. And what I thought of this was 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, which talks about, um, as we read, that all scripture is, um, God breathed all scripture's prophets for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So doctrine is very simply what we're supposed to do, right? That's what doctrine is, what we're supposed to do. Reproof, what, when we're not doing what we're supposed to do, which is like Micah chapter 3 that we read tonight. You know, you're not supposed to do that. That's what reproof is. Correction, how to get back to what we're supposed to do in the first place. Right? These are just practical definitions of what God's word is supposed to do. And then the word instruction, the phrase instruction in righteousness. Um, the word instruction is a Greek word that means training. It means, um, it doesn't mean, it means prolonged practice. It means like, you know, going to school over time. When, the last time I had an opportunity to share God's word was in the Me on My Path, chapter 10, and we talked about how leaders um, lead incorrectly and people follow. We also talked about the fact that, um, the best way to learn God's Word, both for us as adults, really, but especially for our children, is a mentor-mentee kind of relationship. And it's long. It's not something you can... Not, um, it's not something you can send your child somewhere, for example, and, and, and that they're going to get that. You know, Christian school can be an adjunct. Church can be an adjunct. But the mentor-mentee relationship has got to be between father and son, you know, mother and son, daughter, whatever it is. And it's small. We're talking about, we're talking about years. We're talking about a couple of decades, a decade and a half. I mean, it's not a quick thing. It's a school. 
It's the school of Christianity, and it's supposed to start in the home. But it's a mentor-mentee relationship. That's what this word instruction really refers to. It refers to training over and over and over and over again. Tell them five million times, and by the five million, they'll probably get it. But it's just like you and me. I mean, my mom and dad did the same thing with me, for heaven's sake. I don't know about you guys, but golly, how many times they tell me to lean over my plate? How many times they tell me to do this, do that? Five million, probably, something like that. <laughs> yeah. But finally got it, eventually, but it took years, and it does for people. It takes years. So that's this instruction in righteousness, right? And righteousness is very simply, it's, it's got a lot of, in my opinion, kind of church baggage with it, but righteousness simply means right living. That's all it means, right living. Live the way you're supposed to live, right? Live what God's Word says. That's righteousness. Right. So, so that, that Greek word is paideia, if you want to look at it. Actually, take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll look at verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 12. It is in turn, a quotation from Proverbs chapter 3. But let's look at Hebrews 12, 5. Uh, verse 5, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, I only want to, that's a quotation from actually um, Proverbs 3.11. I want to read, this This was a great translation. There's a reference book that I will look at a lot for the Old Testament. I think they do a great job. But anyway, this translation is from them. They're really good with the Hebrew stuff. They'll bring out kind of finer meanings of Hebrew words and that sort of thing. A lot of it's over my head, honestly. It really is. I mean, a lot of it, like they're... That they're quoting Hebrew words, and I try to read it, but I'm not there yet. But I'm stretching. I'm trying to do that. But the point is, he brought this translation for Proverbs 3, 11, 12. The school of Jehovah, my son, despise not, nor loathe his correction. For Jehovah corrects him whom he loves, and that as a father his son whom he loves. So the, the phrase that caught my mind was this, the school of Jehovah, because the, the, they brought out the fact that the basic meaning of the Hebrew word um, that's translated uh, chastening is to go to school, to send to school. And that's exactly what this training is. I mean, that's what it is. We're, we should always be in school, our whole lives. It plays right into the whole idea that Christianity is always a becoming. We'll look at a couple verses along those lines, but... One that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And when he says, therefore, my beloved, beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, it's the Greek word become. It's not the word be. Another, um, let's see, another great one is Ephesians 4, 32. Be ye kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's the word become. Because we don't ever arrive. We're never there. It's always a becoming. It's always a growing into it. It's always a school of Jehovah. Always. If it's not, for me, if it gets to that point, then I'm doing something wrong. Then, then that's my fault. But it always should be that for We'll just confine this to Christian men who are either leading themselves, leading a wife, leading a family, leader in church, or all of the above. We, we should always be in that school of Jehovah. We should never not be in that school of Jehovah. I mean, that 8 o'clock bell should always be ringing. We should always be thinking that way. Now, do I always? Absolutely not. In fact, this was kind of when I saw some of these things in God's Word and just considered my own habits on very basic Christian habits. This was convicting for me because, I mean, unlike Paul, for example, you know, Paul, when, when we read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, okay, so when Paul wrote that, he was this far from death because they were about to murder. And he's at, like, he's about the same age as the A.D. year. He was killed in something like 65, 66, something like that. 
while Nero was still the Roman ruler. So he's about that age when he writes that book, right? Um, don't you know that between the imprisonment that we read about at the end of the book of Acts and his martyrdom, which happens after 2 Timothy, don't you know he went on another missionary journey? Yeah, he went to, we know that he at least went to Crete. We know that he went to Ephesus. We know that he took Timothy to Ephesus. We know that he left Titus in, in, in uh, Crete. We know that he went other places when he'd already been in prison once for doing what he was doing. And they were still after him and they were going to come after him again. And he was in his 60s at a time when travel was not go catch a plane. But he always stayed, uh, I will say, there's a, great, uh, there's a great phrase that, oddly enough, I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute any godliness to this individual ever, but there's a great phrase that Steve Jobs, believe it or not, cited um, when he did, he did a commencement address for Stanford, I think, in 2005. And he quoted a phrase that was on the back of a, how many people remember the whole Earth Catalog ever? There you go. Okay, it, it quit publishing in like 1974 or something like that. But on the back page of their final publication, they had a phrase, stay, I think it was stay lean, stay foolish. Very simply, stay lean means you, you're always a little bit hungry. You're never totally satisfied. Stay foolish, you're never just accepting the status quo. You're not doing the same thing and expecting a different result. You're, you're on the lookout for a better way, right? So stay lean, stay foolish. <clears throat> the point being, Paul is the best example biblically of, I mean, obviously Jesus Christ as our Savior, but Paul as a Bible figure, best example I know of, because he stayed hungry his whole life. He stayed foolish, finding new ways to spread God's Word his whole life. It never stopped. It never stopped. I mean, in 2 Timothy, one of the last things he says to <clears throat> Timothy is, to bring the parchments. Right? He was going to be dead for heaven's sake. He just said that a few verses before that. You know, bring the books, but especially the, the parchments. So he stayed lean. He stayed foolish. He was always the becoming. He was always becoming, which is what we should be as Christians. We should always be becoming. That's all wound up in that word instruction. We should always be in that school of Jehovah, so to speak. Before we go on, let's all take two minutes, stand up, greet somebody, walk around, get a drink if you need to. I don't care. Yeah, Sorry, I do. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Joel Fisher. Hey, Dave. Hey. 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 Good. How are you? Good. How are you? How are you doing, brother? Good. Being reproof and the whole chapter being to leaders, essentially, we see again and again 
leaders of the people, you leaders of the people, you priests, you prophets, etc. And then again, he kind of synopsizes the whole thing again, right? But the, the thing that uh, I continually came back to was the, the importance of our biblical choices. Um, I mentioned that one of the reasons I showed you that very first um, very first that was that it represents redemptive history. Just as one example in the redemptive history. That is to say, and what I mean by redemptive history is God's continually working to bring His people back to Him. To, to uh, actually confer the blessings that He promised through Abraham on the children of Israel. He is constantly trying to do that. And just as He's constantly trying to bless us as well. But that is redemptive history. Bringing us bringing uh, mankind to the point of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And being able to actually escape the consequence of death that we sustained back in Genesis chapter 3. Right? That's redemptive history. Getting us to the point where real redemption was actually possible. So, many times, as I think you can imagine, God had to uh, rely on people's choices. What choices they they made and the consequence of their choices. As they, and we're going to look at a couple of these, but one of the reasons I showed you this was as an example um, when during the Egyptian slavery and then when they come out we'll read this record in Numbers chapter 14, but there was a consequence of about 40 years of just wandering in the wilderness because of choices that some leaders made chosen guys to go in and Buy out the promised land. You know, 12 of them all together. And they're all actually named, believe it or not. I bet you the 10, if they ever, I mean, I assume they'll be in heaven, I hope, but I bet you they wish they weren't named. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb? Yes! The other 10? No! <laughs> but they are all, in fact, named. Right? In any case, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, and we're going to read the record of their perspective, of the choice they made based on the evidence that they saw in the promised land. And what the other ten did. And what then the people did based on what they heard. Right? So the point being, God sort of, I will say, God is almighty. I, I'm not saying God is not almighty. God does whatever He wants to, whenever He wants to. But from the start with mankind, He gave man a choice. From Genesis chapter 3, do this, don't do that. If you do that, you're going to die. The very first thing, right? I mean, it's right there after he creates the creation of man in 1, the kind of reiteration of that creation in 2, then chapter 3, here's your choice. And we see that truth of God working within man's choices and giving man's choices all through God's word. All through God's word, from the very start. So, I want to look at some of that, um, and I apologize, I have to, you might want to not look at the screen, but I have to kind of pass this forward. Okay. So, we talked about Genesis. The next one we'll look at, if you'll take your Bibles, now we're going to actually read Numbers chapter 14. This is the record of the children of Israel being on the cusp of entering the promised land. Right? And they're sending in spies, which... Not sure they really needed to do that anyway. <laughs> After all, God said, I'll put you in, you know, I'll send you in, I'll take, I'll take care of you, I will do this. But they send in spies. And we're going to literally read this whole chapter. So, we'll start in Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. And this is again in the context of choices. The leaders that we see being reprimanded in Micah chapter 3 made choices about what they were going to do and why they were going to do it. They're, they're not only what they did, but their motivation. We see again and again, they were doing it for money. Right? What they did, and why they did it. Again and again we see that. But all of chapter 3, which we're specifically looking at tonight in Micah, we see that, that what they did, and why, and the choices they made. So, Numbers 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice, and cried, and the people wept that night, 
And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Now, we're not going to pick this apart too much, but just think about the fact that a million and a half people are in the wilderness being miraculously, miraculously sustained every single day by God. And they want to go back to Egypt. They want to die in the wilderness rather than realize God's promise. Just think about that as we read this record. By the way, this record picks it up after they get the news. Joshua and Caleb, yes, we can do it. The other ten, no, we can't. Right? This is how the people start to react and how Joshua and Caleb um, uh, intervene. Therefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt, into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return unto Egypt. Wow. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not you against the Lord, neither fear you the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with sword. Now, in a, in a more modern translation, not a King James, can somebody read verse 9? In a, like, whatever you got. It's not a paraphrase, but an actual translation of the camel. Uh, New King James, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our great. Their protection is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Very do good. not fear them. Very good. Does, does any other translation that you might be looking at have any different word for the word protection in there? Do they say anything else? Do they translate it any other way? They all just say something like protection or defense or something like that? Yeah. Okay, so the reason I want to point that out is that Hebrew word is actually the word shadow. It's the word like you cast a shadow on shadow. And the reason, this is really interesting to me because... So Joshua and Caleb were talking, right? He says, these guys are bread for us. Now, mind you, every single day, they're getting manna from heaven. Right? Every single day, that's how they're eating. Six days out of the week, not every single day. Six days out of the week. On the sixth day, they had to gather enough for six and seven, right? But then, every, they're getting bread six days out of the week. It's raining down, they gather it, they eat every day, right? So manna was designed such that when it fell... You went out and gathered it, but you couldn't keep it until the next day. When the sun came out, it burned off, right? So Joshua and Caleb learned from that analogy, and they are comparing the people of the land to the manna that's going to disappear because the shadow's gone. As soon as the shadow passes away, or away from, as soon as the sun starts to shine on it, the manna disappears. They're saying the same thing about the people of the land. The shadow, the protection is gone. They're going to be just like the manna. They're going to disappear. That's exactly what Joshua and Caleb are saying here to the people. They learned from God's example of miraculously sustaining them. And what they, the analogy was, these guys in the land that God is going to give us, that he said he's going to bring us in, are just like the manna. The shadow is gone. It's going to burn off. They're going to go. Joshua and Caleb learned that. The other ten, the circumstance, they couldn't get over the circumstance. Their, the circumstances were bigger than their God, essentially. The circumstances were bigger than their God. Does that, is that clear, what I mean about that Hebrew word shadow and why they used it that way? Is that, because it's, it's um, the word protection, the translation protection is really actually good. If you did, just did shadow, you wouldn't necessarily understand why they said that. But they said that because that happened every single day. Manna fell, they gathered the manna, so the sun came out, the manna disappeared. Right? 
And you couldn't gather two days worth, you gathered one day worth. If you gathered more than that, it said it started to rot. Essentially, that's what happened. Right? So they saw that every single day, and they just applied the same thing to that situation with the promised land. It was no different to them. <laughs> uh, let's see. We're going to keep reading just because it's a great record. Okay. Uh, the rest of verse 10. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere or before they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. Now, God is incredulous that these guys are seeing miracles every single day. How long is it going to be before they believe? What do I have to do to get you guys to believe that I'm going to do this for you? Right? That's what's, what God's saying to Moses. Verse 12. Uh, I will smite them with a pestilence, disinherit them, will make of thee, you, a greater nation and mightier than they. So he says, Moses, it's you and me. Let's get rid of them. Right? I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Moses intervenes. You know, they, Moses and God essentially talk. We're going to skip some of that just because I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but we'll skip, skip down to verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted now, me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them to be seated. Now the only thing I want to point out about that is because of those guys' choices it changed what God intended actually did. He was going to bring them into the promised land because of the way the leaders reacted to what they saw and the people followed those leaders, those ten guys and they were they, they let these twelve people, right? We're going to, and they name them. You go in and you look. They come back. Two of them good, ten of them bad. We're going to follow the bad ones. Because of that choice God changed. It, it resulted in 40 years of wandering. 40 years of wandering. Right? And again, for as individual men, um, we always have to be benchmarking our lives with God's Word, with the God-breathed Word. We always have to be doing that. We always have to be in that process of becoming, of that instruction in righteousness that 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 talks about, 16 talks about. Um, let's look at a couple other examples of just the importance of our choices. Uh, it's, this are truly only just a couple of verses. Look at 1 Samuel 15. I mentioned um, uh, Saul to you. 1 Samuel 15. This is regarding uh, Saul. After he disobeys something God specifically and directly told him to do. And we're not going to read the whole record. It's relative to how he took care of a conquered people. Um, he let he was told to essentially wipe them out. He didn't do that. So let's look at 1 Samuel 15, 22. And this is Samuel speaking here. And he says, and, and it says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Direct correlation. What Saul did resulted in what God did. The poor choice that Saul made directly resulted in what happened to him. The biblical importance of our choices on a day-by-day -day basis. I mean, they not, for me, you know, my day-by-day -day choices aren't going to influence a nation. But they'll influence me. They'll influence my wife. They'll influence my kids. They'll influence people I interact with. They may influence people at the church. You never know whether, I mean, everything you do, I, I think you can say this probably if people are paying attention. Everything you do has an effect on people you interact with. Or maybe on yourself, certainly on your husband, wife, children, etc. I mean, it's got an effect. The choices you make 
may not shake a nation, but they can shake you, they can shake your family, they can shake others. So the biblical importance of your choices is critical for all of us, even though we're not a Saul, we're not the king of a nation, right? We're still the king of us. We're still the leader of our marriage. We're still the leader of our family. We're still a leader maybe in the church. We're still, you may be a leader in your place of employment. Any of those things, or all of those things. So just critically important that we make um, godly and biblical choices. And I referred earlier, if you remember, I talked about the divided kingdom, right? You know, you get to Solomon, Solomon dies. Rehoboam, his son, is, is designated as king. But the people rebel. There's a southern two tribes, Judah. There's a northern ten tribes, Israel. So there's that divide, what's referred to as the divided kingdom or divided monarchy. Jeroboam was the king of the northern ten at that time, right? And I want to read just one thing about him. It's in 1 Kings chapter 12. Uh, because you may remember in Micah chapter 1, uh, well, uh, actually, let's, before we read this, let's point that out. Yeah. Um, keep your finger in, in 1 Kings 12 and look back at Micah um, chapter 1. I just want to point out one verse to you. Micah chapter 1. Yeah. And it's verse 5. Micah chapter 1 verse 5. Okay. And then we'll read about how this, why this is significant. Why it says it in Micah chapter 1. Micah chapter 1 verse 5. For the transgression of Jacob is all this and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? You know, high places referring to idolatry. In Jerusalem, supposed to be the, the capital of Israel, the godly city, right? But high places are there. That is to say, idolatry. Okay? The same was going on in Samaria, which is why they say, was, is not the sin Samaria for Israel? And so let's read about that. Now we'll look at 1 Kings chapter 12. And we'll only read truly a couple of verses here. Uh, a few verses. This is, again, Jeroboam is the, the new king, right? So we'll read in 1 Kings 12, 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. In other words, he's afraid that his northern ten are going to try to reunite with the southern two and everybody's going to be the same, but he's not going to be the king anymore. Right? That's what he's afraid is going to happen. 1 Kings 12, now 27. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. You may remember Pastor David um, when he talked about the feasts, uh, mentioning that there were feasts to which all male Israelites were, went each year. They would go to Jerusalem for these feasts. Like we read about in Acts 2 with the Passover. That's why there were, it talks about all the people from all over the world that were in Jerusalem at the time. Because they came from wherever they were, they went to Jerusalem for that feast. The same thing was happening here. What Jeroboam is afraid of is, when they go to Jerusalem and they see Jerusalem and they see the temple, etc., etc., they're going to want to reunite. I'm going to lose my ten tribes. Right? So he's thinking this. He's thinking, this is what's going to happen, but I want to keep my kingdom. But if they keep going there, I'm not going to keep my kingdom. Right? So what's he going to do about that? Let's read about that. Verse 28. Whereupon the, the king took counsel, this is Jeroboam, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> so he essentially institutes idol worship. He does the same thing the children of Israel did in the wilderness when they were waiting for Moses to come down from Sinai. Wow, wow. I don't know what happened to this Moses. Make us a calf. And that's what, we won't read that record, but that's when Aaron says, you know, Moses comes down and says, what did you do? Aaron says, well, there's this gold that I put it in and there came out this calf. So the Israelites, Jeroboam institutes the same thing. He puts these in the city of Samaria, right? And there's one, I think, even in more northern Israel, in the, in the city of Dan. In any case, 
That's why Micah 1 5 refers to isn't the sin Samaria, because there was idol worship there. This goes back as far as Jeroboam and Rehoboam, which is like uh, 300, 2 to 300 years before Micah, something like that. Hmm. A long time before, a number of kings before. Jeroboam was the first king of Israel and the first king of the divided kingdom. But he institutes this. <laughs> How and then so what did the people do? And you can read about this when you read about the kings. There's a good king that tries to eradicate this, although they are never successful. Even the good kings aren't successful, they're completely eradicating this. And there are the bad kings who actually make it worse. Right? But the people always go with the leaders. They go with the leaders. Uh, the other thing I thought about in terms of our choice, let's just look at John 13.35. One of the things that is um, affected by the choices we make is our witness, how we witness to Christianity in the first place. In John 13.35, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this verse, but it says, John 13.35, by this, Jesus Christ is speaking, of course, shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Just simply want to point out, love is a choice. Right? If you're going to act lovingly, that's a choice. You act in a certain way. Greatest definition I hope is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. You know, charity suffers long, is kind, envies not, wants not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not its own, is not easily provoked, really means is not provoked, thinks no evil. Right? That's the best definition I know. Those are choices. You decide to, to act that way. You decide to think that way. And then you have a witness. Well, wow, that guy's a Christian. Look at how much love. Man, that guy's not a Christian. Look at how he acts. Because that's how it goes. And I think then there was... Oh, the only other... We don't have to go there, but Romans 10, 9, and 10. What's affected by our choices? For us, the most profound, eternal um, effect of our choices is whether we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior or we don't, determines our eternal destiny. It determines whether we have eternal life at all. That's a choice. Obviously, that's a choice. And the only other thing I want to mention along the lines of just choice in general is, if God gives us a choice, biblically, whether you're talking about the choice that we had in Genesis 3, or the poor choice that Saul made, or the choice that we make to believe in Jesus Christ, or the choice that we make to be loving or not loving, if he gives you a choice, does it not imply that God believes, God feels you can make the right choice? Why would he give you a choice if he didn't think you could make that choice? Does that make sense? If, if he gave us a choice, then he believes we can make the right choice. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that. So when Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, must mean that we can do that, that we can get there. Now, I'm not saying alone. I'm not saying we're doing it alone. It's always a Philippians 2, your work out as God works in. It's always that. But the point is, He wouldn't tell us that if we couldn't do it. You know, if something bad goes wrong, if something happens to us because of poor choices we make, it's not God's fault. It is not God's fault. If we make poor choices, and there's a consequence. Just want to point that out because I think that is a common malady among Christians. They think that God doesn't love them because something happened, when in fact it happened because of a poor choice they made. I just want to point out, gentlemen, your choices are extremely important. Not only to you, but the people around you. The people whom you lead, whether maybe you know it or not. I mentioned earlier the stay hungry, stay foolish. It wasn't stay lean, it was stay hungry, stay foolish, I think, yeah. And uh, that we should, I guess I will, I will leave you with this thought, we, we should always as Christian men be becoming. It's, it's easy to coast. <laughs> it's easy to coast, it really is. And it's, it's easier in this country than other places because we have all the nice things that we do. It's easy not to be hungry. It's so easy. You know, it's easy to live 30 minutes away from church and 
rationalize that on a Sunday morning. That's a really long drive. It's raining. It'll be bad. I think I'll stay home today. When, for the Sermon on the Mount, they probably walked miles. Or when um, the guy that they let down through the roof uh, on the uh, pallet needed healing, they broke up the roof and let him down. <laughs> there was nothing that stood in the way. They were hungry. They wanted it. Period. Well, it's easy to coast. And, and I'm, I'm not pointing any fingers. It's easy for me to coast too. And I'm as guilty of it as anybody else. We've got to stay hungry. We've got to stay foolish. That is looking for better ways to be a Christian. To be a man. To be a husband. To be a father. To be a leader in the church. Otherwise, I mean, if we ever get to the point where we think we've cornered it, wow, made a huge mistake. Huge, huge mistake. Um, and I think that's all, so I'll close with prayer. If there any comments or questions. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Uh, thank you for your word. Uh, Heavenly Father, I do ask that for all of us that you continue to show us things in your word that, will, that we need to learn individually, that we need to incorporate in our lives to be better Christian men. Um, I thank you again for these men, for their willingness to take the time to be here. I thank you again for your word. Um, what a blessing it is to us, what, uh, how we can look to it as our manual, how it is a light to our path, and how it guides us. Um, Heavenly Father, help us to, to follow, just to follow, to listen and to obey. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.